We have begun the lectureship with a really, really good start yesterday, concluded last night with a very powerful lesson by Brother B.J. Clark, and it really set the tone for a, a great lectureship ahead of us. The theme, of course, this week is reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Matters of housekeeping we need to tend to. I want to mention to you about uh, the bookstores. We have a couple of bookstores, both Chula Vista and also Christian Family Bookstore are in the back, and they have some excellent material as well as uh, a number of displays that are set up, and we encourage you to go back and check those. We have CDs available for all of the lessons this week. The CDs will cost $1 a piece if you want just the audio copy. If you would like the CD collection for the entire week, it will be $30. If you want a DVD, we're also making DVDs of the lessons. If you want a DVD, they are $5 per lesson or $30 if you want the entire set of DVDs. And so you come out way ahead if you get the entire set of DVDs. Uh, we also have uh, the books that are available. If you would like the hardback copy of the book, that, uh, the cost of that is $13.50. And if you would like to have a PDF, that is a CD with uh, all of the PDF, uh, in fact, all of the books of uh, the Power Lectures uh, going back to the beginning, we have those available outside as well. Today, lunch is going to be provided. The menu today is chicken and dressing, purple whole peas and corn, and desserts are going to be provided today by the Nesbitt to Coldwater and South Haven congregations, and we appreciate them so much for doing that. Today, lead to today, 9 o'clock through 2 p.m., we're going to have the students from the Memphis School of Preaching with us, and they're going to be leading the singing and also leading us in prayer. This morning, we're going to have Brother Neil Bennett. He is a second-year student uh, at the Memphis School of Preaching. He's from Memphis. He's going to be leading us in prayer. And Brother Michael Clark, who started the Memphis School of Preaching in January of this year, he is going to be leading our singing, and so we're going to turn it over to them at this time. Number 271, 271, <clears throat> we'll sing the first two verses of this song. <clears throat> God, creator of all the universe, maker and knower of all men's hearts. We come before you now, Father, thanking you for the good night rest that we had. We thank you, Father, for the beauty of the day. We thank you, Father, for the beauty of your creation. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to gather to study your word and to be more like your son, Jesus. Forgive us, Father, when we're not. Help us all to be better servants. Thank you, Father, for 
the South Haven Church of Christ and for this lectureship. We pray your blessings upon it and upon each person that is present here today. Go with us now and may everything that we say and do be pleasing in your sight. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Our speaker this hour is Brother Gary Colley. I guess that I have known Brother Gary Colley as long as I have been preaching. I cannot even remember when I first uh, became aware of Brother Colley. It seems like he's always been there. <laughs> he has been preaching for 61 years, and he has been married for 60 years. Brother Colley has a detailed introduction in the um, a lectureship book, and so I won't go through that, but I'll tell you this. Currently, he is preaching for the Get Well Congregation. He also oversees the Spiritual Sword Lectureship, and he is a regular with us at the Gospel Broadcasting Network. We love and appreciate him very much because oftentimes we have called him on short notice, and he has stepped in, and we know that he is one who is sound and reliable, and we can rest assured we'll do a good job, and we appreciate that so very much about him. Of course, the theme of the lectureship this week is from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. That's our theme, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Brother Kali is going to be speaking to us on the topic this, this hour, preaching the word with all authority. Come speak to us, Brother Kali. I appreciate so much that kind introduction, and I'm glad Maggie's here to hear it. And uh, we're happy that we can come and be with you today and appreciate the invitation very much. I've had a little problem with my throat. I think I've just talked it out. But at any rate, I'm glad that we can be with you, and we look forward, of course, to our study together this morning. He said this was a pretty good crowd. I think it's an excellent crowd for Monday morning, and we appreciate so much each of you who have come. We do have those from the Getwell congregation present. I'm always happy when they're here and people from different places where we have known them and appreciated them very much. Of course, Brother Taylor's down here on the front, and we thank the world of him and also of Irene. Our study, of course, as he said, was to mention the theme, and rebuking and reproving and exhorting, but our special lesson is to be about the authority of that. You know, and these uh, preachers who are with us this morning from the Memphis School of Preaching, they know that they have to have authority for what they preach or else they're not going to preach correctly. Indeed, Jesus said, in, for, through his apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 6, 15, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In other words, he's gonna show that someday to these who do not accept his authority. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he said, now all authority has been given unto me in heaven and upon earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them, into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. And lo, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Do we want the Lord's presence with us? If we do, we're going to see, have to speak the word of God with authority. But that's not our authority. That's the authority of the Lord. He is the only one who has authority. And if you're speaking something just from your own desires and your own will, you're not speaking with the authority of heaven. We want to be careful then that we do not forget that. We want to always speak with authority. And that's what Titus was told in Titus 2.15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.16, If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. But necessity is laid upon me, and woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. Woe, of course, means pain, difficulty, punishment. Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel of Christ. In 2 Timothy 4, as he noticed this morning for us in verses 1 through 5 or 6, Paul said, I charge thee in the sight of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. You preach the word. Preach what? preach the word. I hear a lot of preaching these days not on the word and that's sad to me because they are ignoring the authority of heaven. Preach the word. Be constant, instant, in season, out of season. 
reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come, he said, when they will not endure sound doctrine. In the New Testament, those who preached always preached with authority. Philip did that when he went to Samaria. Saul did that when he went to, to Damascus, and Peter did that when he went to Judea and Samaria and Galilee. Preaching the word of God, the good news of the gospel, is a blessing to our lives. It is that which every person needs to hear. It is that which all of us need to know, if we are gospel preachers, that it's the highest calling that anyone can possibly have. There is no more delightful work to do than to preach the gospel to the lost and to help them to see the light of the gospel of Christ, which is able to save their soul. If you have that ability and you have that privilege to preach the gospel, rejoice in it, delight in it, because it is indeed that which will bless you beyond measure in this life and that which is to come. And of course, these are important qualifications for you to have. If you don't have the ability, don't try to preach the gospel. If you do not have the opportunity or the privilege, then you don't have the responsibility. Responsibility, though, includes two things. That's opportunity and also ability. And those who are sincere, dedicated, biblical preachers of the gospel, this, this spells success for them, and it is that which will bring accountability and liability in that last great day. What better way do we have of helping our fellow man than teaching to men and women the gospel of Christ faithfully? Paul said in Acts 20, 26, 27, I am free from the blood of all men. I call you to record this day. You know that's true, don't you? That I'm free from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. What a wonderful thing Paul could say. And he says, now I didn't preach just by myself, I preached by the authority. In Galatians 1.12, he said, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not after man. For I did not receive it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Revela or Romans 1.14, he said, now I am a debtor, though to the Greeks and to the barbarians, the wise and the foolish, and so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you also who are at Rome. At that great dispersion from Jerusalem, when, the Stephen's, when Stephen was stoned, you remember that Acts 8, 4 says they went everywhere preaching the word. And when Philip went down to the city of Samaria, Acts 8, 5 says he preached Christ unto them. Is there a difference in preaching the word and preaching Christ? Absolutely not. But it's important for us to notice that preaching the word and preaching Christ are indeed the things which we are to preach by the authority of heaven. You know, when they believed Philip's preaching things concerning the kingdom of heaven in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Now that gives us a suggestion of the points Philip made, and it tells us what we're to preach by the authority of heaven. First of all, we're to preach the kingdom of God. When they believed that Philip's preaching things concerning the kingdom of God, then that was his number one point. Second of all, not only to preach the church or the kingdom, but he preached also the name of Jesus Christ, that is, the authority. So he was always aware that he was to preach with the authority of heaven behind him. And, of course, he preached baptism because these men and women were all baptized into Christ at his preaching. So it suggests to us that to preach the word is to preach the kingdom, to preach the name of Christ, to preach baptism. And if we don't do that, then we're not preaching by the authority of heaven. These people entered the field of labor in which the Lord had already taught them, you know. In other words, he taught that woman at the well in John 4. And then he says to them also in verse 35 through 38, Say not ye, there yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, that they're white already unto harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. Both he that soweth, and he that reapeth, may rejoice together. And hearing that saying is true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon ye had not bestowed any labor. No other men had labored there first, and then ye entered into their labors. Well, could he have been talking about that which he had taught when he taught the woman at the well? And then all of the people came out to see him and to hear him. And they said, we're convinced not only because of what you said, but because we heard it ourselves. Well, he certainly spoke with the authority of heaven, didn't he? 
So our assigned text today from Titus, the second chapter, verse 11 through 15, says the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. And he said, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, uh, zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. What do you know about Titus? Have you ever studied about Titus and who he was? Well, really, there's not a lot to be known about him except that he was an outstanding servant of God. We don't know where he was baptized. We don't know who baptized him. We don't know who his parents were. We do not know where he was from. But we do know that he was an able and devoted companion of Paul. He's mentioned several times in 2 Corinthians, in Galatians, in 2 Timothy, and of course in this epistle. But where he was born and when he was converted and about his family background, we do not have any information. But we do know that Paul put a great deal of confidence in him. Left him in Crete, you remember, to establish the things that were lacking when Paul had to leave there. Just like... <coughs> Pardon me. Just like Paul also left Timothy over at Ephesus when he had to set in order those things that were lacking there. What a wonderful thing. Then these men served such faithful service in the Lord's kingdom. And in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul said, Now these things write I unto thee, hoping to come to thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar of God and the ground of the truth. He had that authority by Paul's helpfulness in writing to him about how to establish the church as he ought to. And so Titus had a great part in the early history of the Lord's church. And he's given an important degree of prominence in Paul's letters in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians rather, he's mentioned nine times. And so we understand that reference to him always was made with a special, a special affection toward him Indeed, those things which Paul felt about him. He delivered then the first and second epistles of Paul to the Corinthians. He was represented as a peacemaker. He was one who did not lack the confidence to go and to speak on Paul's behalf. Paul had established the church in Corinth, but now Titus is going to help it continue. And so he worked with him at Corinth, according to 2 Corinthians 8 and also chapter 12. And he's highly commended in 2 Corinthians 7. He was evidently not a Jew. He was not even a Jewish proselyte. And the way we know that, of course, was that when Paul took him to Jerusalem with him, he refused to have him circumcised because he was not a Jew and because Jews did not have, or Gentiles did not have to keep that law of Moses in order to be saved. That was not a part of the plan of salvation. So Acts 15, they settled that matter that circumcision was neither before or after baptism for a Gentile to be a faithful child of God. But Titus is told now these things speak, that's specific. These things, these things which you've heard of me, these things speak. And you know words are means used by God to convey his thoughts to us. We wouldn't know the things of his mind and his thoughts and his character unless he had revealed them. In fact, Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 through 13, when he said, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. But God revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For well, the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man that is in him? And even so the things of God knoweth no man, save the Spirit of God. Which things, he said, we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Well, that's what the apostles did from Acts 2, 4 on. In other words, it says when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 4, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, we should be so thankful to God that he has spoken to us through his words that we can understand. God, who at sundry times in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, he hath in these last days spoken unto us through his Son, 
whom he gave to be the heir over all things, through whom he made the world. In Ephesians 3, we read in verses 3 through 5 that Paul, of course, said that those things which he received was by revelation, that he might know the mystery of the gospel. In other words, the mystery was that, as our young men will tell you in the school, of that which is concealed until it is revealed. And so Paul was revealing these things. And he said, these things are given to us whereby when ye read, you can have my understanding of the knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles by the Spirit and the prophets. In Ephesians 5, 17, he said, Now be not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So our text here, I think, is kind of a summary of the work Titus was instructed to accomplish. He was to speak. He was to speak in certain ways. These things which were given to him, it should be the manner and the duty of every gospel preacher today to do just what Titus was instructed to do. I would recommend to all that we read these words given to Titus as well as First and Second Timothy if you want to be a successful gospel preacher. It is indeed important that we do that. We follow the practices that were taught to Titus and to Timothy. And of course, this is the object of preaching the doctrine of Christ, especially with all authority. So when we talk about Timothy here, of course, he was told you meditate on these things. First Timothy 4, 15 and 16. Give thyself wholly to them, profiting may appear to all, that thy profiting may appear to all. And you take heed unto yourself and unto your teaching. And you continue in these things, for in doing this, thou shalt save both thyself and them that hear thee. You know, all religion is taught. You don't come here knowing any kind of religion, whether it be pure religion or whether it be vain religion. You have to be taught those things. You know, James 1, 26, 27 speaks of both of those. He talks about that religion that is vain. Then he talks about pure religion, undefiled, before God and the Father. Well, all people have to be taught the truth if we're going to walk in the truth. They have to have the authority of heaven if they're going to be saved at last. And so isn't it important that we understand the Lord's system of faith and practice has to be taught. And that's what our work is. In John 6, 44, 45, he said, No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I'll raise him up in the last day. It's written in the prophets. They shall all be taught of God. Everyone that hath heard and learned cometh unto me. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, John 17 and verse 17. And so in John 8, 31, 32, he said to those Jews that believed upon him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Can we make men to know the truth? Oh, yes, we can. Be careful, though, that that truth is only in harmony with that which the Bible reveals because that's where the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We are to preach the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And according to our text, the proclaimer of truth is to do that with exhortation and reproof with all authority. I know you're going to hear quite a bit about exhortation and reproof this week. And I don't want to double up on these men that are going to be speaking. But let me remind you again that when one speaks the truth with authority, it means truth preaching. It means that he's preaching what the Lord taught him to preach. Since all authority is given to Christ, then we must walk under that authority by which he spoke. And when he spoke these things, he did speak the same thing in harmony with that which we're studying here. He spoke with all authority. Have you noticed in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, in the latter part of that, chapter 7, verse 28, 29, it came to pass that when Jesus ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. Watch it now. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as did the scribes. Jesus taught with the authority of God. He brought God's word to the world. And his perfect teaching, of course, was carried on by the Holy Spirit through the apostles. In fact, he's going to tell them now, the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same thing commit thou unto faithful men who will be able to teach others also, Paul says. So in the preamble of the Church of Christ, Jesus spoke clearly of the dangers, of the duties, and the motives of those who are in the New Testament church, and he did so with authority and with brevity. 
Well, we not only see that he was uh, lacking in human doubts or limitations, he did speak without limping like the, like the scribes did. He spoke with authority. Well, that's a, that's a subject we ought to be studying then too, isn't it? When you speak, don't be hesitating. Don't be backwards. Do not feel limited. Speak with authority. And that's what we're all as preachers to do. If you don't speak with authority, people are not going to be impressed with that which heaven has taught. Be sure and you make it to known that you're not speaking by your own authority, but by the authority of heaven. Now he says exhort. Well, that word, Titus is commanded by Paul to exhort those to whom he preached. And it's still the exhortation for us. We are to exhort. Well, that means we are to encourage, doesn't it? We are to bring strength and help to those who are in danger of dying in sin. And so we have to exhort them as we preach to them and warn them that disobeying the Lord's gospel and the authority of heaven will bring them nothing but disaster. It was and is certainly important now to urge doubters and those who have fallen short after obeying the gospel to return to the faithfulness that they ought to be. And the diligent preacher of God's word will be one who is one of exhortation. I have but to mention one name to really show you that, and that's Barnabas. You know Barnabas, he was a generous member of the Jerusalem church. He had land, he sold it, he brought it and laid it at the apostles' feet to help those who had come to Jerusalem who ran out of money and ran out of things to sustain them. And so because of that, Barnabas received great honor. Barnabas was one also who is called the son of consolation in Acts 4, verse 36, 37. And he was one who was one of exhortation. He was a Levite, and he was one who was greatly influencing those in the early church. He was a man of special character and special talent who encouraged and exhorted. It is said by some that he would go with the gospel preachers and apostles, and after they had preached, he would get up and exhort the people to obey what they had heard. Well, that would certainly be in line with what Paul has said to us, isn't it? And this certainly would be in agreement with the meaning of exhortation. So it is to this day an important thing for gospel preachers to be sure and speak the word and to exhort. But the next word that we have is reprove. And that word you'll hear more about this week also. It's not something that everybody desires to do, especially those who may stand in the pulpit. They don't always want to reprove the sin that they see. And that's a shame, that's a disgrace because it's imperative if we're gonna turn men from their sins and direct them in the right way to reprove them of that which is wrong. I put in the book Robert J. McCracken's thoughts on four basic aims of preaching, which I believe are very important. We believe that either any well-prepared gospel preacher will pay attention to them. First of all, he says to enlighten the mind. Second of all, to disturb the conscience. Second, third of all, to energize the will. And th fourth of all, to stir the heart. Well, when we're entrusted with the salvation of the souls of men, we should not fail in that trust that we have been given. When we think about Matthew 16, 26, where Jesus said, what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Then we realize how important our work is, don't we? Those souls are in your hands. Those souls are before you there, and you are to reprove them of their sins so they'll turn from them. Do you know the mission of the Holy Spirit? I, I'm kind of shocked sometimes that people do not always know the mission of the Holy Spirit. What did he come for? Well, Jesus gave that in John 16, 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world in respect of sin, of righteousness, and of the judgment. He's going to reprove. In other words, he's going to expose sin. And he's going to show what sinners are headed for. But he's also going to show the righteousness of Christ. You can't convict a man of sin and righteousness at the same time. But he wasn't going to. He reproved the world in respect of their sin, of the righteousness of Christ by which they could be saved, and of that judgment which was to come. So the idea of convicting one of wrong, reproving and convincing and rebuking him, that's all a part of preaching the gospel with authority. And the mission of Christ was to seek and save the lost, was he not? Luke 19.10, and he did this how? 
by preaching, by preaching. And that's the way we're to do it. So when we see the method of saving the lost, when God, of course, came to preach his word with the apostles and through his son, it was always with reproof. Now, 1 Corinthians 1, 21, he says, Seeing that in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom knew not God, it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Well, it wasn't foolish preaching, but it was to those who were not wanting to hear it, foolishness. Well, when we notice with all authority, Titus is instructed to speak in Titus 2.15 with all authority. And that's what we ought to remember too, to speak with all authority. And the gospel preachers, of course, must refer to and be sure that the word of God is standing behind their teaching and behind their preaching. I hear some people today who say, I'm not for scriptural preaching, or I'm not for backing up everything we say with the scriptures. Well, where's your authority if you don't? Certainly we should back it up with the scriptures. If you can't find it in the scriptures, you don't have any authority for it. In 1 John 4, 1, John warned, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but prove the spirits whether they be of God. For many false prophets are gone into the world. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, he said, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. The Bereans are commended more than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether these things were true. You know, Titus was a true preacher that one ought to be imitated today as he rebuked those who were in sin, the offenders of God's commandments. And he is to express a judgment of what wrong is and what is contrary to God's will, and he is to admonish and warn these people that they need to turn from their sins or else they're going to be eternally lost. That, my friends, is what reprove means. And so he shows his interest. He shows his concern, which is what love is in the Bible, interest and concern. And so we realize that after a while, some Christians uh, start out pretty good, but after a while, a new wears off. And so they turn away from the Lord. That's a very dangerous thing to do. But what are we as gospel preachers going to do about it? Well, we have to warn them. We have to reprove them, don't we? And Peter did that, of course, when he talked about in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. You know, after they've escaped the defilements of the world, he said, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, while the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it, to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, a dog returning to his own vomit, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You talk about reproof. That's strong reproof, isn't it? But we realize how important that is because our authority, which must come from above, is to be spoken and breathed as God would have us to do. You see, all scripture is inspired of God, and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Well, Jesus, of course, spent his time teaching the apostles so that they could go and teach others. Do it with all authority. And he said to 2 Peter 1, verse 18 through 21, that we need to know something before we know anything else. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures, no teaching of the scriptures, of, is of any private origin or interpretation. But script, or prophecy came not in old time, he said, but the will of man. But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the chosen apostles were promised the Holy Spirit. When Jesus had to go back to heaven, he would be to them a comforter. And, of course, that was a very important thing. He would teach them all things the Lord had taught them. He would bring to their remembrance those things which they had been taught. And in John 16, 13, he said, I'll be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear, these shall he speak. And he will show you things which are to come. What about the authority of heaven here? Well, certainly they received it, didn't they? They received it because all of these things given by God was from the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he would abide with them. And he would bring to their remembrance the things that Jesus had taught them. And it caused Paul to say, though we are even an angel from heaven, 
preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. And as I said before, so say I now again. If any man preach unto you any other gospel than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Do I now persuade men or God? If I yet please men, he said, I should not be the servant of Jesus Christ. Well, what does it mean when it says that he directed those apostles into all truth? Well, it simply means the Book of Mormon is a latter revelation that is not authorized by God because the apostles received all the truth. And any addition to that is too much. Any subtraction from that is too little. The Koran are these new translations that do not translate. All of these are to be condemned. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 says, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the tree of life and out of the holy city, which are written in this book. So we as gospel preachers, we as members of the Lord's body, Jude 3 says you're to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered unto the saints. And Jesus instructed the apostles, you know, that they would be endued with power from on high and that they were to wait for that power and that they were to speak only as that power influenced them to do so. So these men spake as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. That power that was promised came to them. And indeed from that day until now, there's been no new commandment about what we must do to be saved. There's been no new promise. There's been nothing additional to that which the Lord would give us in the new promises to the faithful under heaven's will. But Acts 2.36, Peter said, Now let all the house of Israel know assuredly that this same Jesus whom he crucified, God hath made him, not you, not me, God hath made him both Lord, ruler, and Christ, Messiah, and we need to remember that we're not the ruler, we're not the Messiah. We're simply the spokesman of that authority from heaven. And so in 1 John 2, 25, he said, this is the promise which he promised us, even life eternal. Now, my friends, I'm talking this morning about unchanging truth. And that's what Titus was told. You speak with authority. Well, you speak what? With that unchanging truth. Hebrews 13, 8 and 9, you know it says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Well, what is he talking about? Some people say, well, he's talking about spiritual gifts. You know, we still have the same gifts today they had then. No, that's not what he says. If you notice that next verse, he not only says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, but he said, be not carried away by divers and strange doctrines. The doctrine of Christ doesn't change. Aren't you glad? Aren't you happy, my friends, that the passing of God's will doesn't come? Because you can know the promises won't, pa won't pass away. When Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 6, I, I want you to know that you believe in God, you ought to believe in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I shall return again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Whether I go, ye may know the way. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, how know we the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, is that going to change? No, no. No, no, the promise will never change. The promise will be the same yesterday as it was today and will be tomorrow. And isn't that wonderful to know that we can trust his plans, his commandments, his promises, and thereby we can speak with authority. As they were yesterday, so they will be today, and they will be tomorrow. And so we are assured that the inspired Apostle Paul, that we are thoroughly furnished unto every good work. In like manner, of course, Titus was too. And Titus and Timothy were to remember that nothing should distract them away from their mission. We have to remember that in one sense, we hold the salvation of the souls of men in our hands. How are we going to treat it? The gospel is for all, as we sing. And into our hands the gospel is given. Into our hands is given the light. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to hold it ourselves? Are we going to keep it or are we going to trust it into the lives of others? The word of God, of course, is the source of all truth. Peter wrote again in 2 Peter 1.3, seeing that by his divine power 
He hath granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. So today, we're to speak. Speak, reprove, speak, reprove, and re exhort, and do it with all authority. And nothing, as we said, should distract us from our mission. You know, we must remember the heavy duty that is ours. Therefore, Paul said, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels were steadfast, and every transgression and every disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto them that, by them that heard him, both with signs and wonders and manifold deeds and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. You know the faithful gospel preacher. I said the faithful gospel preacher really has no choice. He has no choice as to what he's going to preach. He needs to preach the truth, <clears throat> the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this is especially true if he's looking for that blessed hope <coughs> and appearing of the glory of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, as Titus 2.13 says. So this letter to Titus is a very important one. It's a brief one. It doesn't take you long to read it, and you should read it often. But he was given, first of all, instructions for setting the church in order. We need to know that, don't we? 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 also would show that. But he was warned to be careful about the actions and the words of the Cretans because he said they're all liars. And you don't want to put a Cretan in as an elder of the church, Titus 1 and verse 12. Well, he was warned also against the Judaizing teachers, those who might <clears throat> influence others to be led astray. And Paul warned Timothy, you know, about that same thing. <coughs> Excuse me, please. And he wanted him to preach healthy doctrine. And these are looking to satisfy not the God of heaven, but themselves. If we have carnal desires, and these carnal desires are in control of our lives, then without any preacher pointing out our sins, we won't live as we should. So therefore, the importance of the work that we have to do. We are instructed, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace which is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same thing. Commit thou unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2. What are these things, the things which thou hast heard of me? Whether they're the facts, the promises, the predictions, <coughs> and also the warnings of the gospel. So preachers are not going to get by with not preaching the truth. And sinners are not going to get by without knowing God's will. Psalms 33 has always impressed me, and I'm sure it will you. Verse 13 and 14, he said, The Lord looketh down from heaven. He beholdeth all of the sons of men. And from the place of his habitation, he looketh upon the inhabitants of the earth. Friend, he knows you through and through. He knows me through and through. He knows where your heart is. He knows when you're ready to preach the gospel in its fullness, its purity, and its simplicity. James said in James 4, 17, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. And also, you know, Paul wrote to the Galatian brethren, and he said, be not deceived. Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth unto the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth unto the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so in summation of that charge given to Titus, to speak with all authority, we realized that he was to teach and to preach plainly, positively, and was to convince those in the knowledge of God that they were to turn and walk in the right ways of the Lord. He arose to the challenge, and so should we. And there was no compromise, no partiality on his part. I remember one man said that when he stepped into the pulpit, he had no friends in the audience. He had no relatives in the audience. What he meant was he was not going to speak for their pleasure, but he was going to speak as the oracles of God taught. You know, Jesus said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And so we need to be sure that we're striving to please the Lord. 
And so Paul says, now let no man despise thee. So he told Titus as well as Timothy, but you be examples of believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in faith, in purity, in spirit. And indeed, that's what we need to be if we're going to be faithful gospel preachers. And if we are, we will approve, we will exhort, and we will speak with all authority as God wants us to do in order that we may save the souls of men as well as save our own souls. I appreciate so much your listening so kindly at this time, and I appreciate the thoughts concerning this uh, teaching of Timothy and Titus. And I trust that you're going to grow in grace and knowledge throughout this week as you study here with the South Haven group. It's been a pleasure to be with you. We praise you and thank you for coming. We appreciate so much that uh, lesson by Brother Kiley. Of course, it is foundational upon if we're going to reprove, rebuke, and exhort that we must do it with all authority. Occasionally, over the years, I've heard preacher friends say that their eldership has asked them not to preach on uh, modesty or not to preach on marriage and divorce or denominationalism or something along those lines. And I always think of this passage, the gospel preacher is to preach with all authority. And as Brother Kali said, that means without limits. You preach what God has said to preach. Thank you so much, Brother Kali. We appreciate that. You are dismissed for about 12 minutes. We ask that you'll be in here promptly for the next session. Brother Mike Hickson is going to be speaking. Take a brief break, and we will start sharply at the top of the hour. Thank you.